a language that fuels the great publishing empires. From the city that never sleeps, 24-7, on TV, cable, radio, electronic media, come the words and ideas that define American culture and market it to the world. You can make a case that New York City is now the global capital of the English language. But what a language, restless, slangy, constantly changing, and ever more informal. Many people believe that change is not only inevitable, but unstoppable. But not John Simon, the acerbic theater critic of New York Magazine. A Yugoslav immigrant himself, he speaks for many mainstream Americans who fear that if American English continues to flout the rules of syntax and grammar, it'll sow the seeds of its own destruction. Well, it has gotten worse. It's been my experience that there is no bottom. One can always sink lower, and that the language can always disintegrate further. How would you describe the state of our language today? Unhealthy, poor, sad, depressing, um, and probably fairly hopeless. Jesse Scheidlauer stands for everything John Simon hates. He's the American editor of the august Oxford English Dictionary. With his dark suit, tie, and rolled up umbrella, he certainly looks the part. But you can't judge a book by its cover, for he's also the author of a scholarly history of the F word. Jesse's often in the New York Public Library looking for new usages. American English has always been inventive, but it is now globally so influential that the Oxford Dictionary needs a full-time office in New York City. Well, American English has always been, at least for the last hundred years, it's always taken great pleasure in its slang. Uh, you can find even Walt Whitman writing in praise of slang in the 19th century uh, about how wonderful it is and how poetic it is and how you know, this is the American spirit distilled into language. So when you come here, what are you, what are you looking for? We'll try to find magazines that have words in them that we think are going to be of interest, and these can be in really any field out there. What are you looking at at the moment here? Well, right now we're looking at some magazines devoted to tattooing and body piercing. There are terms for these different kinds of piercing, and there are terms for different kinds of tattoos. Uh, Blue, a music magazine, has a lot of stuff about hip-hop, which is a big influence on the language. You know, guide to zines. Fan well, magazines. Yes, well, they're just called zines nowadays. Zines nowadays, nowadays yeah. So if you find a new, a new word in one of these, one of these really lurid magazines mm -hmm. um, and you decide to put it in, does that mean that the dictionary has adopted the word and, and as it were, recognized it? No, not at all. For now, it just means that we have an example in the database. But then we have an example in Time magazine, and then we have an example in New York magazine, and now we have an example in so-and-so. And we start to think, well, OK, this is a term that started off as a very restricted subcultural thing, but now it's very widespread. And the fact that we did read something like this originally will tell us something that we wouldn't know if all we read was Newsweek. I see. Language enthusiasts tend to be either prescriptivists or descriptivists. Descriptivists like Scheidlauer and other dictionary makers are content to describe language as it changes. Prescriptivists like Simon believe you need prescribed rules to preserve language. The descriptive linguists are a curse upon their race uh, who uh, of course think that what the people say is the law. And by that they mean the majority, they mean the uneducated. I think a society in which the uneducated lead the educated by the nose is not a good society. Descriptivists deny treating uneducated usage as the law, since they label it non-standard. But they may record things like the often violent, homophobic, misogynistic lyrics of gangster rap. The result gives new currency to words like ho and bitch. What do you say to the people like John Simon who are really angry about what they see as a serious decline in linguistic standards in this country? 
Well, I think they're wrong, uh, and I think they're misguided. Uh, language change happens, and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, maybe change is inevitable. Maybe, maybe dying from cancer is also inevitable, but I don't think we should help it along.